Hello, social media viewers. I'm Annette Larkins, and this presentation is a tribute to my late husband and a synopsis of our life together. As he rests in peace, may his electrifying energy remain forever present. Although 1933 may have been the worst year of the Great Depression, a bright light shone on April 23rd in the small town of Hawkinsville, Georgia, when Amos and Dinah Larkins welcomed son Amos Larkins Jr., the first of their three children. Second son, Willie Edward, was born in 1934 and daughter, Willie Bell, in 1942. When baby Amos was six months old, the family migrated to Miami, Florida, where he became deathly ill and was not expected to live. However, his maternal grandmother concocted an herbal remedy that not only allowed him to survive, but also to thrive into manhood. Unlike his siblings who graduated college, Amos dropped out of school in the eighth grade, bent on becoming a self-made man. The years ahead were challenging for an eighth grade dropout, especially for a young black man limited by ridiculous Jim Crow laws. He did not know what he would do to become his own boss, but he knew determination, self-education, and hard work were crucial to obtaining his goal. The menial jobs that came his way were a means to an end. His mantra was, I must do what I must do until I can do what I want to do. Some of his early positions included unskilled laborer at the University of Miami's Animal Testing Laboratory. Also, hospital custodian. The dog days of summer had him sweaty and rushing home to shower away the stench of working in an animal kennel all day. An example of his determination to succeed is after completing Army basic training, he was in a group waiting for a duty assignment. When asked who in the group could type, none of the others raised their hand, so he raised his. Untrained in typing, he used a two-finger method to become supply quartermaster and was so good at the job, he advanced from private first class to corporal. Back home in 1953, with an honorable discharge from the armed forces, he and his first wife settled in South Miami, Florida with their three children, where he opened a sweet shop which did not last too long due to inexperience and inadequate funds. The marriage did not last long either. And in later years, their children, Michael, James, and Dolores died in early adulthood. There were miles to go before finding his niche in the business world, but he learned from his mistakes and held fast to his dream. In the meantime, he moved on. And in 1958, he met me, his wife-to-be. That story makes me chuckle, and I love to tell it. It happened that in 1955, the Platters, a singing group consisting of four guys and a girl, became famous. Thereafter, naturally, young singing groups sought to duplicate their success. So where I lived in Coconut Grove, Florida, every time four guys formed a singing group, my telephone rang. I joined several fledgling boy groups. I even cut my hair in a style to imitate the Platter's Zola Taylor. While those hopeful high school groups were trying to break into show business, an established group of five young men called the Dellos was working the local nightclub circuit. When one of their members got into trouble and had to serve time, they searched for a replacement. They too had the idea of adding a girl singer. That is, everyone except Amos. He was dead set against the female troublemaker coming to break the group up. And since he was group manager as well as a member, they had to convince him to just listen to her, man. 
Since we had never met, he asked his sister, Willie Bell, who was my classmate, to get my phone number. We arranged to meet at the Sir John Hotel in Overtown, Miami, where many black entertainers worked at the hotel's night beat club and lived in the hotel's suites, unable to stay in white-owned hotels when performing on Miami Beach. Before he became famous, I met Flip Wilson and other famous stars there. But back to meeting Amos. The Dellos sang a song that included the words, Here comes Fanny walking down the street. In the foyer of the hotel, I was walking toward the entrance as they, Amos, John, David, and Johnny entered the building. I sensed they were telling him, there she is. When we were introduced, Amos said to the fellas, you guys already know that she can sing. Let's set up a rehearsal. And that was that. No audition, just rehearsals. And I stepped into the role of Fanny walking across the stage like she was walking down the street before stepping into the background to harmonize. For whatever reason, I never took a photograph with the group, but I did have a matching pink vest and black skirt to match the guys' costumes. We were married six months after meeting, and his prediction came true about a female breaking up the group, because even though I was not a troublemaker, our plans as husband and wife did not include the Dellos. When we met, Amos lived with his father, mother, and sister in Richmond Heights. Now a mixed community, but at the time, a Miami suburb developed by Captain Frank Crawford Martin, a white Pan-American pilot who was sympathetic to the plight faced by blacks because of racial prejudice and segregation in the United States. He developed an affordable housing community between 1949 and 1950 for black American World War II veterans. It was eventually complete with school, post office, church, and water tower. The distance between Richmond Heights and Coconut Grove is 16 miles. Because he did not own a car, Amos either caught a ride with someone he knew going that way, caught the bus, or hitchhiked. This mode of travel was a daily ritual going back and forth. But Cupid's arrow had so pierced both our hearts that it had to be done. We later laughed about his aching feet. He wore shoes that were aesthetically pleasing to the eye, but were too tight for comfort and caused excruciating pain. So late nights when his ride would take him only so far, causing him to walk the rest of the way home, he would remove his shoes. Finally, there was a vacancy in the apartment building where my mother and I lived, so he and John Shaw, lead singer of the Dellos, became roommates. John moved out when we married. Each guy in the group had a day job. Amos worked with his Uncle Ed at a metal shop. But money was not plentiful, and saving for the future was not feasible. We put our heads together and decided to become a domestic couple. This alleviated paying rent and cut down food expenses. Our third and final job as domestics allowed us to experience another thing we had in common. In addition to our love of music, we loved to travel. The Darlings family owned a winter home in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and a summer home in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So our first trip together was to Minnesota as a live-in housekeeper and cook. The funny thing about that arrangement was I, the designated cook, did not know how to cook. I came from a household where my mother did everything, cooking, ironing, and cleaning, and taught me nothing of the kind. Of course, I did not have to be taught how to clean. That seemed to have come naturally. On the other hand, Amos's mother taught her children basic household duties. Amos taught me how to iron and how to make a couple of simple dishes that he knew how to make. But I used to call his mother or mine in Florida to ask cooking questions. Working in my favor 
were the five Darlings' children, who for the most part were not picky eaters. Mr. Darling would eat practically anything, and Mrs. Darling, unfortunately, had a condition known as argusia, the loss of sense of taste. She truly ate to live. My cooking mistakes were overlooked because the children loved me. And Mrs. Darling said I was a smart cookie because I was always teaching them something. Mr. Darling loved Amos, provided him with a car to drive, and was always encouraging him to try out for the Minnesota Vikings. Our stay with the Darlings was enjoyable and financially lucrative, but when I was five months pregnant with Amos II, our firstborn, we decided to go back to Miami to be with family. We stayed with Daddy and Mama, Amos's parents, and Amos worked in a shoe repair shop. When our baby Amos was three months old, we opted to return to Minnesota, where our second son, Anthony, was born 10 months after our first one. We were uncertain where we wanted to settle, but Amos, being dissatisfied with job options and our desire to be close to family again, sent us packing on the Greyhound bus back to Miami. This time, we had Daddy's and Mama's house to ourselves because the Reese family, for whom they had worked several years, had an ill aunt who required live-in help. So Mama took over that household while Daddy continued to make deliveries for their boat supply company. Amos obtained an okay job delivering boat supplies for a different company than Daddy's, but was still trying to open his own business. The 1960s brought him closer to his goal. But in the meantime, he left no stone unturned. The man was a true hustler, selling everything from wigs to waterless cookware. In 1963, George Holmes, a friend who leased the butcher concession in the neighborhood convenience store, grew tired of running the shop and offered Amos the opportunity to take it over. Amos jumped at the chance took the necessary steps to gain control, and shazam, he was the new Richmond Heights butcher. Always the hustler, he hired Calvin Hill as butcher apprentice to cover when he was busy elsewhere. Elsewhere involved an introduction to the world of insurance. His first connection was with an industrial firm where he went to homes and collected weekly premiums. Through his brother, he later discovered that industrial insurance, also known as debit insurance, was inferior to ordinary insurance, but was the only kind with which black people were familiar. When his brother Willie left his public school teacher's position to educate black people about the difference between the two types of insurance, Amos followed his lead, obtained a life insurance license, and joined Willie at John Hancock Life Insurance Company. They both were outstanding agents who won many awards. The 60s decade was looking up. Like his friend George, Amos also lost interest in butchery. He opened Larkin's agency and became an insurance broker, selling policies from different companies to accommodate his clients' needs. He became an income tax preparer, bought real estate properties and rented them out. He created a diversified business using Larkin's agency as an umbrella under which various entities flourished. In the late 80s, our son Anthony, who had become computer savvy, began working in the office where he updated office conditions and improved productivity by introducing computers with software that made work much easier. Amos was fascinated by computer technology and proud of our son's knowledge of it. They worked well together and business grew. He was proud of both our sons. Amos II, who created the Miami-based music sound, always had his father's approval of his music productions. Much went on during these years. Amos opened a nightclub called The Other End. He managed singer David Hudson, who recorded the popular song, Honey, Honey. And things were going well. We were able to enjoy our love of music and we traveled extensively. A few trips took us to Canada, 
where we visited Andre Dawson, Amos's cousin who played with the Montreal Expos baseball team. We went to Mexico City. We were at a bullfight. A bull ran up the stadium steps right next to where we sat. We stood atop a live volcano in Costa Rica, and we visited many other places that quenched our thirst for travel. The young eighth grade dropout's vision had been realized. The lucrative years allowed us to add an addition to our home, where we entertained guests at parties. We drove the latest automobiles of our choice. We enjoyed a taste of the good life. But the 2008 Great Recession caused a decline in economic activity, and we, like most, were affected adversely. Nevertheless, unlike many, because Amos managed finances well, we were able to maintain our home, and he continued business, but now it was home-based and not as profitable as before. Still, we continued to count our blessings for the love of family and for all that we had. When illness struck my husband, we were happy that Anthony and his wife Tanisha and their children lived nearby. But we were especially grateful that Amos II moved back home so that he and I could provide 24-7 home care. We lived as normally as we could, making my husband as comfortable as possible under the circumstances, both physically and mentally. Even in sickness, we frequently laughed and reminisced about the past, and we constantly expressed our love and appreciation for each other. Oh, we argued, too, like many families do. As I said, we lived as normally as we could. We are often afraid of death. We don't understand it. We don't know what to expect. But prior to his transition, my husband and I experienced a profoundly positive interaction that totally abolished his fear of death. It was an encounter few people have, something else for which I am eternally appreciative. To help to achieve my 18,000 steps a day, I would circle my husband's hospital bed while we talked. It was not unusual for him to ask if I had gotten enough sleep, but this time he asked the question oddly. He asked, Do you sleep? Yes, I sleep, I said, wondering why he had asked the question that way. Oh, really, he said. Do you sleep all the time? Yes, I do, I said. My curiosity at the way he was questioning caused me to stop walking, so I sat in the chair by his bed as he asked, Do you ever wake up? Well, now, I answered in the affirmative, but in my mind, I was thinking to myself, This is really getting weird. I was concentrating so much on the weirdness that I failed to properly focus on his next question. I didn't know what it was, but I thought it referred to our long-term marriage, so I felt perfectly safe in my response. I said, really, really, I mean, I was just so happy and proud that he was asking, <laughs> that I thought he was asking that. So I, I very proudly said, yes, 64 years. cocked his head and looked at me as if I were a stranger and said, 64 years? Do you know me? Well, now, I stood straight up, indicating I had to go to the bathroom. I said, excuse me, I'll be right back. I rushed off bypassing a bathroom and entered a back room where Amos II has his recording studio. When I reported to him what had happened, we just looked at each other puzzled, not knowing what to think or what to say. So finally, I said, let me get back to Daddy. As I approached his bed, I asked, are you okay? 
Yes, I'm okay, he said. I'm just trying to figure out about these 65 years. He said 65 instead of 64. I said, oh, just dismiss that. I misspoke. You have other questions, so go on. Ask them. Now, at this point, I didn't know if he saw me as an angel at the gate or what. I knew that he did not see me as his wife. So I instinctively took on a role to assist in his quest to determine his final destination. The questions that followed led to this one. He asked, Am I going to heaven? Yes, I said, of course you're going to heaven. Hell is the bad place. You don't want to go there. Are you sure, he asked. Yes, I'm sure, I said. Well, you know I've done some bad things in my life. Everybody's done some bad things, I said, but God knows your heart, your mind, and your spirit. And God knows you're a good man. You've taken great care of your family. You've honored your father and mother. You've done good things for other people. Most importantly, you have accepted our heavenly Savior. So yes, you're going to heaven. Oh, good, he said with such joy. Always thinking of his family, he asked, Is my wife going to be there? Yes, I said, your wife's going to be there. I told you, hell is the bad place. She doesn't want to go there, so she'll be with you. What about my boys? Are my sons going to be there? Yes, I said, your sons will be there too. Even the one who curses every other word, he asked. <laughs> Ladies and gents, he was talking about Amos II, whom you've seen and heard in our videos. What you haven't heard is that it has been his custom to swear like a sailor. So his father was definitely talking about him. I chuckled and said, Oh, we'll work on the cursing. But like you, God knows his heart, his mind, and his spirit. And like you, God knows he's a good man. If you ask for a donut, without hesitation, he's out the door to get it. He takes good care of you. You had a bad bed sore on your backside. He healed it so well. When the medical team came to visit, they all agreed. He could be a wound specialist. And your wife said, when he was born, you nor she knew to whom she was giving birth. But you later found out you had won the lottery. Oh, he sincerely honors his father and mother, and he takes excellent care of you. Yes, he does, he said. Yes, he does. He had a few more questions, which I answered to his satisfaction. But after a brief pause, he made a statement. He said, you know, I feel like we're alive, but I know that we're dead. I said, if that's what you feel, that's what it is. But have no fear. God has your back and everything's gonna be all right. With a big smile on his face, he said, yes, it is, yes, it is. He fell into a deep and seemingly comfortable sleep. When he awoke, he called my name. We had a regular conversation with no mention of the previous exchange. Transitioning had begun. Three days later was his birthday. Two days following his birthday. He called my name. Annette? Yes, honey, I answered. I'm tired. I said, 
I understand. Then remembering his recent birthday, he shouted out, And I'm 90 years old! With that acknowledgement, with that declaration, we knew he was ready to cross over. Four days later, Amos II stood to the right of his father's bed, stroking his chest. I stood to the left, caressing my husband's forehead. Anthony had told his father earlier that he loved him and that he and his brother would take good care of me. The attending nurse softly announced, He's gone. I nervously asked, Are you sure? He looks like he's still breathing. With that, my husband inhaled deeply, then exhaled. It was his last breath, but oh, he looked so peaceful. It was ethereal. All suffering ceased. He had reached his final destination. He was at final rest. Our life together with its ups and downs, ins and outs, has been undeniably worth it. As I reflect on our life together, I'm reminded whenever anyone would say to my husband, I'm your wife's number one fan. He would always say, no, I'm my wife's number one fan. People all over the world, he was. My king never denied me anything. And I am so thankful to have been his queen for 64 years. Years. Ooh. In less love, you bet. you